The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, okay? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be okay. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health, or unemployed, or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. Okay. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax, or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those, somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use, a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't, actually. Now, I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. OK, first question. It's still a branch of the Popular Bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm. And when is it open? Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's... Just weekdays, I'm afraid. Mm. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9.30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it, next to the travel agency? That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh. And
then one last thing on this. Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No. There's nothing mentioned here. Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance, you know. It may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre... Go along Market Street past the post office and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre. Mm. Then you take the first right. You'll see an internet cafe on the other side and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. OK, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre and go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street. Mm. There you turn right again and carry on up as far as the next junction where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one, uh, the National Bank? You can go either way from the centre, really. Up West Street or Bridge Street and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear Joanne describing her home city of Darwin in Australia to a man called Rob who hopes to go there. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Joanne? Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So tell me about it. Well, where shall I start? Well... Darwin's in what they call the top end because it's right up at the northern end of Australia and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that... 
we've got the same laid back atmosphere you get all over Australia, probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realise until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art and music and dancing and so on are concerned because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theatre and opera in the same way as cities down in the south like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artists' groups and writers' groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international? Yeah, they say there's over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but um, when a very bad storm, a a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions. But after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious centre today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, But believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So which places would you specially recommend? Well, one of the most popular attractions is called Aquacene. What happens is every day at high tide, hundreds of fish come in from the sea, all different sorts, including some really big deep sea fish. And some of them will even take food from your hand. It's right in the middle of town at the end of the Esplanade. It's not free. I think you have to pay about $5. But it's definitely something you have to experience. Then, of course, Darwin has a great range of food. Being such a cosmopolitan place, and if you don't have lots to spend, the best place to go is to Smith Street Mall, where they have stalls selling stuff to eat. There's all sorts of different things, including Southeast Asian dishes, which I really like. You'd think there'd be plenty of fresh fish in Darwin, as it's on the coast, but in fact, because of the climate, it mostly gets frozen straight away. But you can get fresh fish in the restaurants on Cullen Bay Marina. It's a nice place to go for a special meal, and they have some good shops in that area too. What else? Well, there's the Botanic Garden... It's over 100 years old and there's lots to see. An orchid farm, rainforest, a collection of palm trees, uh, a wetlands area. You can easily spend an afternoon there. That's at Fanny Bay, a couple of kilometres out to the north. 
then if you've got any energy left in the evening, the place to go is Mitchell Street. That's where it all happens as far as clubs and music and things are concerned. You'll bump into lots of my friends there. Talking of friends, why don't I give you some email addresses? I'm sure they wouldn't mind. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. Before you listen to their conversation, you have a chance to read questions 21 to 24. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst's report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. I think, um, I think your condition has a lot to do with, um, shall we call it, way of life, habits? Way of life? Habits? Yes, now tell me, Mr Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes. I smoke, what, about 40, 50 a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But, uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's, it's no good. You see, 50 a day is overdoing it, you must admit. You must cut down at least that. Oh, yes. I know that when you're feeling tense, you, you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course. But, well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down. But, oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort or, or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see... Well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about, about your other habits. Right. Now you have a chance to read questions 25 to 30. As you listen to more of their conversation, answer questions 25 to 30. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally, during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now, let's see. Up at 8 in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast? The usual. A cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two. Then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I, uh, yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. 
Uh, yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch. No, first brunch. A cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub. All very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinners around about eight. Uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet. But uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then? Well, then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner, we read or watch TV. But I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend that you that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but eleven、uh... says right. Well, that's all right. But lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad. A salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb. Granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No. That won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, Doctor. But no. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a presentation by a second-year environmental studies student on research into edible vaccines. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. I've chosen to give my seminar presentation on a very interesting piece of appropriate technology, designed to prevent sheep and goats from contracting a particularly virulent disease called goat's plague, which is a big problem across large parts of Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia. The Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore has been working to produce genetically modified peanut plants to deliver an edible vaccine. In other words, vaccine which is given through the medium of food. In this case, it is given through genetically modified peanut leaves, which are often used as animal fodder in India. Why is edible vaccine considered much better suited to the local conditions and needs than ordinary vaccines injected by needles?
Well, firstly, injected versions are very expensive to produce, whereas edible ones are cheap, which must surely be one of the most important plus factors when choosing a mode of delivery. Secondly, a big drawback with injected vaccines is that they easily perish when they are not kept cool. By contrast, there are far fewer problems with storing edible vaccines. They can last a long time outside a fridge. You can imagine that in remote rural areas, that is an enormous benefit. Another advantage is because this edible vaccine only contains one viral protein, it allows vets easily to pick out which animals are infected. It's apparently a common problem with injected vaccine that vets can't distinguish between sick and vaccinated animals. However, edible vaccines do have their drawbacks. The major problem is ensuring that exactly the right dose is delivered. The amounts of vaccine which develop in a given genetically modified plant differ significantly depending on the growing conditions. Obviously, too little of the protein might leave certain animals insufficiently protected. And there is also another shortcoming related to the issue of dosage of these vaccines. 99% of the protein actually perishes in the sheep or goat's stomach. We therefore cannot be sure just how much is getting through and working to protect the animal. These negative aspects really have to be addressed to ensure that animals receive maximum benefit. And finally, as with all GM crops, the transgenic peanut plants will have to be grown under strict supervision. If we are to ensure that it does not contaminate peanuts grown for human consumption. Now, moving on to the next part of my seminar presentation. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.